Osio, Ale, Didani Lesti, Tawadan, Sunoi, Wahia. Hello and welcome. My name is Sunoi Wahia, or in English, Nightwolf. Queen Mu, also known as Queen Mu of Copan, was a significant figure in the ancient Maya civilization. She ruled the city-state of Copan, located in present-day Honduras. During the 7th century AD, Queen Mu was renowned for her intelligence, leadership, and contributions to the arts and culture of Copan. Under Queen Mu's reign, Copan experienced a period of prosperity and artistic flourishing. She was known to be a patron of the arts, particularly in the fields of sculpture, architecture, and pottery. Many impressive structures, such as temples and palaces, were built during her rule, showcasing the advanced architectural techniques of the Maya civilization. Additionally, Queen Mu supported the development of Copan's intricate hieroglyphic writing system, this system allowed the Maya to record their history, religious beliefs, and achievements. The Hieroglyphic Stairway, a grand stone staircase inscribed with hieroglyphs, is one of the most famous examples of Queen Mu's contributions to the written record of the Maya. Queen Mu's reign came to an end with the decline of Copan and the collapse of the classic Maya civilization. Despite this, her legacy as a powerful and influential ruler continues to captivate historians and archaeologists, shedding light on the rich cultural heritage of the Maya people. With this, we are going to look at the book, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx, by Augustus Leplongin, author of Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches, a sketch of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and their civilization. To accept any authority as final and to dispense with the necessity of independent investigation is destructive of all progress. From Man by Two Cellas, what you have learned, verify by experience, otherwise learning is vain. This is an Indian saying. In this work I offer no theory. In questions of history theories prove nothing. They are therefore out of place. I leave my readers to draw their own inferences from the facts presented for their consideration. Whatever he their conclusions is no concern of mine. One thing, however, is certain neither their opinion nor mine will alter events that have happened in the dim past of which so little is known today. A record of many of these events has reached our times written by those who took part in them, in a language still spoken by several thousands of human beings. There we may read part of man's history and follow the progress of his civilization. The study in situ of the relics of the ancient Mayas has revealed such striking analogies between their language, their religious conceptions, their cosmogonic notions, their manners and customs. Their traditions, their architecture, and the language, the religious conceptions, the cosmogonic notions, the manners and customs, the traditions, the architecture of the ancient civilized nations of Asia, Africa, and Europe, of which we have any knowledge that it has become evident, to my mind at least, that such similarities are not merely effects of hazard, but the result of intimate communications that must have existed between all of them, and that distance was no greater obstacle to their intercourse than it is today to that of the inhabitants of the various countries. It has been, and still is, a favorite hypothesis with certain students of ethnology that the Western continent, now known as America, received its human population, therefore its civilization, from Asia. True, there is a split in their ranks. They are not quite certain if the immigration in America came from Tartary across the Strait of Bering, or from Hindustan over the wastes of the Pacific Ocean. This, however, is of little consequence. There are those who pretend, like Klaproth, that the cradle of humanity is to be found on the plateau of Pamir between the high peaks of the Himalayan ranges, or like Messrs, Enon and Bartholomew, St. Hilaire, who place it in the region of the Timaeus, in the countries where the Bible says the Garden of Eden was situated, while others are equally certain man came from Lemuria, that submerged continent invented by P. L. Sclater, which Hekel one believes was the birthplace of the primitive ape-man, and which they say now lies under the waves of the Indian Ocean. The truth of the matter is that these opinions are mere conjectures, simple hypotheses, and their advocates know no more when and where man first appeared on earth than the newborn babe knows of his surroundings or how he came. The learned wranglers on this shadowy and dim point one Hekel, Ernst, Hist, of creation, forget that all leading geologists now agree in the opinion that America is the oldest known continent on the face of the planet, that the fossil remains of human beings found in various parts of it, far distant from each other, prove that man lived there in times immemorial and that we have not the slightest ray of light to illumine the darkness that surrounds the origin of those primeval men. 
Furthermore, it is now admitted by the generality of scientists that man, far from descending from a single pair, located in a particular portion of the Earth's surface, has appeared on every part of it, where the biological conditions have been propitious to his development and maintenance, and that the production of the various species, with their distinct, well-marked anatomical and intellectual characteristics, was due to the difference of those biological conditions and to the general forces calling forth animal life prevalent in the places where each particular species has appeared and whose distinctive marks were adapted to its peculiar environments. The Maya sages doubtless had reached similar conclusion, since they called their country Mayach. That is, the land first emerged from the bosom of the deep, the country of the Shoot, and the Egyptians, according to Herodotus, boasted that their ancestors, in the lands of the West, were the oldest men on earth. If the opinion of Lyle, Humphrey, and a host of modern geologists regarding the priority of America's antiquity be correct, what right have we to gainsay the assertion of the Mayas and of the Egyptians? claiming likewise priority for their people and their country, it is but natural to suppose that intelligence in man was developed on the oldest continent, among its most ancient inhabitants, and that its concomitant civilization grew apace with its development. When, at the impulse of the instinct of self-preservation, men linked themselves into clans, tribes, and nations, history was born, and with it a desire to commemorate the events of which it is composed. The art of drawing or writing was then invented, the incidents regarded as most worthy of being remembered and preserved for the knowledge of coming generations were carved on the most enduring material in their possession, stone. And so it is that we find today the cosmogonic and religious notions, the records of natural phenomena and predominant incidents in the history of their nation and that of their rulers sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces of the civilized Mayas, Chaldeans, and Egyptian, as on the sacred rocks and in the hallowed caves of primitive uncivilized man. It is to the monumental inscription and to the books of the Mayas that we must turn if we wish to learn about the primeval traditions of mankind, the development of civilization, and the events that took place centuries before the dim myths recorded as occurrences at the beginning of our written history. Historians, when writing on the universal history of the race, have never taken into consideration that of man in America, and the role that in remote ages American nations played on this world stage, and the influence they exerted over the populations of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Still, as far as we can scan the long vista of the past centuries, the Mayas seem to have had direct and intimate communications with them. This fact is indeed no new revelation, as proved by the universality of the name Maya, which seems to have been as well known by all civilized nations, thousands of years ago as is today that of the English. Thus we meet with it in Japan, the islands of the Pacific, Hindustan, Asia Minor, Egypt, Greece, Equatorial Africa, North and South America, as well as in the countries known to us as Central America, which in those times composed the Maya Empire. The seat of the government and residence of the rulers was the peninsula of Yucatan. Wherever found, the name Maya is synonymous with power, wisdom, and learning. The existence of the western continent was no more a mystery to the inhabitants of the countries bordering on the Mediterranean than to those whose shores are bathed by the waves of the Indian Ocean. Valmiki, in his beautiful epic The Ramayana, says that, in times so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon, the Mayas, great navigators, terrible warriors, learned architects, conquered the southern parts of the Indo-Chinese peninsula and established themselves there. In the classic authors, Greek and Latin, we find frequent mention of the great Saturnian continent, distant many thousand stadia from the pillars of Hercules toward the setting sun. Plutarch, in his Life of Solon, says that when the famed Greek legislator visited Egypt, 600 years before the Christian era, Sanchez, a priest of size, also Sinophis, a priest of Heliopolis, told him that 9,000 years since, the relations of the Egyptians, with the inhabitants of the lands of the West, had been interrupted because of the mud that had made the sea impassable after the destruction of Atlantis by earthquakes. The same author again, in his work, to Facey and Orb Lunas, as Sila recount to his brother Lampius all he had learned concerning them from a stranger he met at Carthage returning from the transatlantic countries that the western continent was visited by Carthaginians a few years before the indicting of Plato's Atlantis, the portraits of men with long beards and Phoenician features, discovered by me in 1875, sculptured on the columns and ante of the castle at Chichen, bear witness. Diodorus Siculus attributes the discovery of the western continent to the Phoenician, and describes it as a country where the landscape is varied by very lofty mountains, and the temperature is always soft and equable. Procopius, alluding to it, says it is several thousand stadia from Ajaja and encloses the whole sea, into which a multitude of rivers, descending from the highlands, discharge their waters. Theopompus, of Quio, speaking of its magnitude, says, compared with it, our world is but a small island, and Cicero, mentioning it, makes use of nearly the same words, omnis in inter quas collator of vabis parva quisetum est insula. Aristotle in his work, De Mirabilo giving an account of it, represents it as a very large and fertile country, well watered by abundant streams, 
and he refers to a decree enacted by the Senate of Carthage toward the year 509 BC, intended to stem the current of emigration that had set toward the western lands, as they feared it might prove detrimental to the prosperity of their city. The belief in the former existence of extensive lands in the middle of the Atlantic, and their submergence in consequence of seismic convulsion, existed among scientists even as far down as the 5th century of the Christian era. Proclus, one of the greatest scholars of antiquity, who during 35 years was at the head of the Neoplatonic school of Athens, and was learned in all the sciences known in his days, in his commentaries on Plato's Timsius, says, The famous Atlantis exists no longer, but we can hardly doubt that it did once. For Marcellus, who wrote a history of Ethiopian affairs, says that such and so great an island once existed, and that it is evidenced by those who compose histories relative to the external sea. For they relate that in this time there were seven islands in the Atlantic Sea sacred to Proserpine. Besides these, three of immense magnitude, sacred to Pluto, Jupiter, and Neptune, and, besides this, the inhabitants of the last island, Posidonis, preserve the memory of the prodigious magnitude of the Atlantic island as related by their ancestors, and of its governing for many periods all the islands in the Atlantic Sea. From this isle one may pass to other large islands beyond, which are not far from the firm land near which is the true sea. It is well to notice that, like all the Meyer authors who have described the awful cataclysm that caused the submergence of the land of Mu, Proclus mentions the existence of ten countries or islands, as Plato did. Can this be a mere coincidence, or was it actual geographical knowledge on the part of these writers? Inquiries are often made as to the causes that led to the interruption of the communications between the inhabitants of the western continent and the dwellers on the coasts of the Mediterranean after they had been renewed by the Carthaginians. It is evident that the mud spoken of by the Egyptian priests had settled in the course of centuries, and that the seaweeds mentioned by Ilamilco had ceased to be a barrier, sufficient to impede the passage, since Carthaginians reached the shores of Yucatan at least 500 years before the Christian era. Now, we will take a short moment to explain the material we have just covered. The author emphasizes that theories are not necessary in understanding history, and that the facts speak for themselves. He believes that the similarities between the Mayan civilization and those of other continents are not coincidental and suggests that there was communication between these civilizations. The author notes that the name Maya was well known across the world, from Japan to equatorial Africa, indicating that the influence of the Mayans was widespread. The author also discusses the belief in the former existence of extensive lands in the middle of the Atlantic, which were said to have been submerged due to seismic convulsions. He cites the work of ancient scholars like Proclus, who wrote about the lost continent of Atlantis and believes that such legends may have had a basis in reality. Overall, the author argues that historians have overlooked the role of our early American nations in world history and that there is much to be learned from studying the ancient Mayan civilization. I reserve the teachings that may be gathered from the study of Maya monuments for a future occasion restricting my observations now principally to the memorial hall at Chichen, dedicated to the manes of Prince Ko by his sister wife Queen Mu, and to the mausoleum erected by her order to contain his effigy and his cremated remains. In the first she caused to be painted, on the walls of the funeral chamber, the principal events of his and her life, just as the Egyptian kings had the events of their own lives painted on the walls of their tombs. Language is admitted to be a most accurate guide in tracing the family relation of various peoples, even when inhabiting countries separated by vast extents of land or water. In the present instance, Maya, still spoken by thousands of human beings, and in which the inscriptions sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces in the ruined cities of Tukatan are written, as are also the fair books of the ancient Maya sages that have come to our hands, will be the thread of Ariadne that will guide us in following the tracks of the colonists from Mayach in their peregrinations. In every locality where their name is found, there also we meet with their language, their religious and cosmogonic notions, their traditions, customs, architecture, and a host of other indications of their presence and permanency, and of the influence they have exerted on the civilization of the aboriginal inhabitants. My readers will judge for themselves of the correctness of this assertion. The reading of the Meyer inscriptions and books, among other very interesting subjects, reveals the origin of many narratives that have come down to us as traditions in the sacred books of various Asians and which are regarded by many as inexplicable myths. For instance, we find in them the history of certain personages who, after their death, be, came the gods most universally revered by the Egyptians, Isis and Osiris, whose earthly history, related by Wilkinson and other writers who regard it as a myth, corresponds exactly to that of Queen Mu and her brother-husband Prince Ko 
whose charred heart was found by me, preserved in a stone urn in his mausoleum at Chichen, Osiris, we are told, was killed by his brother through jealousy and because his murderer wished to seize the reins of the government. He made war against a widow, his own sister, whom he came to hate bitterly after having been madly in love with her. In these same books we learn the true meaning of the tree of knowledge in the middle of the garden, of the temptation of the woman by the serpent offering her a fruit. This offering of a fruit, as a declaration of love, which was a common occurrence in the everyday life of the Mayas, Egyptians, and Greeks, loses all the seeming incongruity it presents in the narrative of Genesis for lack of a word of explanation. But this shows how very simple facts have been, and still are, made use of by crafty men, such as the high priest Hilkiah, to devise religious speculations and impose on the good faith of ignorant, credulous, and superstitious masses. It is on this story of the courting of Queen Mu by Prince Ah, the murder of her husband purposely disfigured by the scheming Jewish priest Hilkiah, who made the woman appear to have yielded to her tempter, perhaps out of spite against the prophetess Hola, she having refused to countenance his fraud and to become his accomplice in it that rest the whole fabric of the Christian religion, which, since its advent in the world, has been the cause of so much bloodshed and so many atrocious crimes. In these Maya writings we also meet with the solution of that much mooted question among modern scientists, the existence, destruction, and submergence of a large island in the Atlantic Ocean, as related by Plato and his Timines and Christians, in consequence of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions of this dreadful cataclysm in which perished 64 millions of human beings. Four different authors have left descriptions in the Maya language. Two of these narratives are illustrated, that contained in the Trono MS, the other in the Codex Cordesianus. The third bass been engraved on stone in relief and placed for safekeeping in a room in a building at Chihen, where it exists today, sheltered from the action of the elements and preserved for the knowledge of coming generations. The fourth was written thousands of miles from Mayach in Athens the brilliant Grecian capital in the form of an epic poem in the Maya language. Each line of said poem, phoned by a composed word, is the name of one of the letters of the Greek alphabet, rearranged, as we have it, 403 years before the Christian era, under the archonship of Enclides, fleeing from the wrath of her brother Ah, Queen Mu directed her course toward the rising sun in the hope of finding shelter in some of the remnants of the land of Mu as the Azores, for instance. Failing to fall in with such place of refuge as she was seeking, she continued her journey eastward and at last reached the Maya colonies that for many years had been established on the banks of the Nile. The settlers received her with open arms, called her the little sister, Isis, and proclaimed her their queen. Before leaving her mother country in the west, she had caused to be erected, not only a memorial hall to the memory of her husband, but also a superb mausoleum in which were placed his remains and a statue representing him. On the top of the monument was his totem, a dying leopard with a human head a veritable sphinx, in ages long lost in the abyss of time when Aryan colonists had not yet established their first settlements on the banks of the river Saraswati in the Punjab, and the primitive Egyptian settlers in the valley of the Nile did not fancy, even in their most hopeful daydreams, that their descendants would become the great people whose civilization was to be the cradle of that of Europe. There existed on the western continent a nation, the Maya that had attained to a high degree of culture in arts and sciences, Valamiki, in his beautiful epic the Ramnayana, which is said to have served as model to Homer's Iliad, tells us that the Mayas were mighty navigators, whose ships traveled from the western to the eastern ocean, from the southern to the northern seas, in ages so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon that, being likewise great warriors, they conquered the southern parts of the Hindustan Peninsula and established themselves there, that being also learned architects, they built great cities and palaces. These Mayas became known in after times under the names of the Navas, they who live in the midst of the water, and are regarded by modern historians as aborigines of the country, or Nagas as we shall see later on. The traditions of the Nagas are obscure in the extreme. They point, however, to the existence of an ancient Nagi empire in the Deccan, having its capital in the modern town of Nagpur, and it may be conjectured that, prior to the Aryan invasion, the Naga Rajas exercised an imperial power over the greatest part of the Punjab and Hindustan. The Nagas, or serpent worshippers, who lived in crowded cities and were famous for their beautiful women and exhaustless treasures, were doubtless a civilized people living under an organized government. Indeed, if any inference can be drawn from the epic legends it would be that, prior to the Aryan conquest, the Naga Rajas were ruling powers, who had cultivated the arts of luxury to an extraordinary degree, and yet succeeded in maintaining a protracted struggle against the Aryan invaders. Like the English of today, the Maya sent colonists all over the earth, 
These carried with them the language, the traditions, the architecture, astronomy, cosmogony, and other sciences, in a word, the civilization of their mother country. It is this civilization that furnishes us with the means of ascertaining the role played by them in the universal history of the world. We find vestiges of it, and of their language, in all historical nations of antiquity in Asia, Africa, and Europe. They are still frequent in the countries where they flourish. It is easy to follow their tracks across the Pacific to India by the imprints of their hands dipped in a red liquid and pressed against the walls of temples, caves, and other places looked upon as sacred. To implore the beneficence of the gods also by their name, Maya, given to the banana tree, symbol of their country, whose broad leaf is yet a token of hospitality among the natives of the islands, then along the shores of the Indian Ocean and those of the Persian Gulf to the mouth of the Euphrates, up that river to Babylon, the renowned city of the sun, thence across the Syrian desert to the valley of the Nile, where they finally settled and gave the name of their mother country to a district of Nubia, calling it Mayu or Mayu. After becoming firmly established in Egypt, they sent colonists to Syria. These reached as far north as Mount Taurus, founding on their way settlements along the coast of the Mediterranean, in Sidon, Tyre, the valley of the Orons, and again on the banks of the Euphrates, to the north of Babylon and Mesopotamia, Maej, that is the land that first arose from the bottom of the deep was the name of the empire whose sovereigns bore the title of Khan, Serpent, spelled today Khan, in Asiatic countries. This title, given by the Mayas to their rulers, was derived from the contour of the empire, that of a serpent with inflated breasts, which in their books and their sculptures they represented sometimes with, sometimes without wings, as the Egyptians did the Urius, symbol of their country. Alien says, it was the custom of the Egyptian kings to wear asps of different colors in their crowns. The Meyer Empire comprised all the lands between the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and that of Darien, known today as Central America, the history of the sovereigns that had governed it, and of the principal events that had taken place in the nation was written in well-bound books of papyrus or parchment, covered with highly ornamented wooden boards. This bird, symbol of the principal female divinity, is met with in every country where Maya civilization can be traced in Polynesia, Japan, India, Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, as in Mayach in the ancient city of Tiahuanuco on the high plateaus of the Peruvian Andes. In Egypt, the vulture formed the headdress of the goddess Isis, or Mao, whose vestments were dyed with a variety of colors imitating feather work. Everywhere it is a myth, in Mayach only we may perhaps find the origin of this myth, since it was the totem of Queen Mu, whose name means Maka, and she is generally pictured, in the sculptures and inscriptions, by the figure of that beautiful bird, whose plumage is composed of brilliant feathers of various colors. Now, I would like to make a short overview of what we've just covered. In this passage, the author discusses various topics related to the Maya civilization and its influence on other ancient cultures. They begin by describing the memorial hall at Chichen, dedicated to Prince Ko by his sister wife Queen Mu. The author compares this to the Egyptian practice of painting the events of a king's life on the walls of their tombs. The author then emphasizes the importance of language in tracing the family relations of different peoples. They mention that the Maya language, still spoken by many people, is used in inscriptions on Maya monuments and in ancient Maya books. This language serves as a guide in understanding the presence and influence of Maya colonists in different locations. The author suggests that studying Maya inscriptions and books can help us understand the origin of certain narratives and traditions. For example, they mention the similarities between the stories of Queen Mu and Prince Ko and the Egyptian guards Isis and Osiris. They argue that these similarities reveal the true history behind what is often considered myth. The author also discusses the significance of certain symbols and myths found in Maya culture. They mention the tree of knowledge in the garden and the temptation of the woman by the serpent, which they argue can be understood within the context of Maya customs and traditions. The passage then shifts to discuss the Maya as a seafaring nation and their colonization efforts. The author suggests that the Maya sent colonists all over the world, spreading their language, traditions, and civilization. They mention the presence of Maya influences in historical nations of antiquity in Asia, Africa, and Europe. The author concludes by discussing the Maya Empire, which encompassed Central America. They mention that the history of the Maya rulers and important events was written in well-bound books. They also note the significance of the vulture, which was the totem of Queen Mu and can be found in various ancient cultures. Overall, the passage provides a detailed exploration of various aspects of Maya civilization, including their monuments, language, traditions, and influence on other cultures. And this will conclude episode 1 of Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. If you would like to express your encouragement towards these works and content, 
please go to paypal.me slash sunogi wahia yt or you can even directly contribute through cash app at dollar sign sunogi wahia for early access to this content i invite you to join my patreon community at patreon.com slash sunogi wahia by becoming a part of this community You'll not only receive exclusive content but early access to my videos and free exclusive content. Any amount you give will be immensely appreciated. Thank you for your generosity.